This is how legends are made. Legendary. There are so many legends in this building today. Legendary. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Legendary. My name is Kevin Jonas Sr. and today is a special day for me. I have some of my dear friends here and a project I am so passionate about, The Freak Show. The Freak Show is a wonderful writer's night in Nashville, Tennessee. I walked in probably a decade ago and fell in love with these people fell in love with the songs, fell in love with the community, fell in love with the sacrifice. And so today really is a dialogue with some people I really respect and I also work with because we're in the middle of developing a TV show with them about their lives, about their writer's night, about the songs, and about how those songs come to be. So today we're able to commune. Guys, welcome. Uh, thank you. I'd love for you to introduce yourself and let whoever listens to this out there in the wide, wide world uh, know a little bit about you. So just tell them your name and who you are as it relates to the Freak Show, and then we're going to dive right in. Well, I guess I should start. I am Terry Joe Box. I am from Nacogdoches, Texas, and I have lived in Nashville for a while. I'm going to show my age. <laughs> 20 coming on 22 years I started a writer's night in like 2004 and have done three three or four writer's nights since then and this music row freak show we started in 2014 and it's a bunch of misfit songwriters that get together every Wednesday and Friday and share their songs and I host it and book it and own the brand and we do it at the local, which the owner of the venue is here with us today, who is also a brilliant songwriter, Jeff Reed. Uh, Thank you. And he is our third home and hopefully forever home for the Freak Show. And I also write for Kevin Jonas Sr. Yes. 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 Part of our publishing empire to come. And to my right is a new kid on the block. (laughs) <laughs> he's also from Texas. He looks like a new kid on the block. I know. He's younger than the new kid. I know. <laughs> and uh, we uh, we thought we were going to lose him a few weeks ago. He had a little heart failure, but he fought back, and here he is sitting with us today. Praise yeah. Jesus. Man, it feels good to be here. Thank you for having me. Cameron you Havens. See? Yeah, I'm from uh, Hazlitt, Texas, and uh, Blue was my first co-write. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Joe was my first round ever in Nashville. You said you walked in 10 years ago and not to be like that guy, but I, I was in middle school. <laughs> you were just that guy. Wow. <laughs> now what I was like, man, that's cool. And then See, I was like, I was, I was old grader. 10 years ago. <laughs> eighth grader. Wow. Yeah, I just, hit my, I just hit my first year in town. Yeah, um, you're almost at puberty now. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Nashville, on the Nashville years. Yeah. And, um... Yeah, the local and quickly become a, a second home and with, you know, the whole heart failure thing. Uh, well, for everybody, everybody that's listening, literal heart failure. You had a yeah. scare. Yeah, uh, but I'm good now. I'm grateful and I had no idea how ready everybody was to wrap their arms around me until it happened. And um, to say that Oh, don't you dare cry. I, I was going to say, you're gonna, Cam, you're... <laughs> to say that uh, Blue and TJ and Jeff and a lot of people just like them are the, what helped get me through um, all their prayers, and I certainly wouldn't be here without y'all, so I love you guys. It's wonderful. Well, I'm glad you're okay. Thank you. Uh, we were praying and getting the updates, and... The, those scares are real. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you think like there's a chance it might not go your way, uh, it definitely puts things in perspective for sure. Well, for perspective, talking like airlifts and emergency exits. Yes. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. I yeah. didn't think this is going to be my first. I didn't think that'd be my first private flight for sure. <laughs> I thought it would be a little more gra- glamorous. I did get Skittles, though, so they had candy on board. That's good. That's good. And a medical team. And a, and and a full yeah. medical and a full team. full medical team. And Skittles. And, sk- and Skittles. <laughs> well, maybe there's a song in there, but right. most importantly, you're here. Yes, sir. 
That's great. Well, welcome today. Thank you. And my cohort here that was around from the beginning. OG, baby. Mr. Blue Foley. Hi, y'all. You're the OG freak. Yeah, one of. Um, <clears throat> there's a few of us. Uh, you know, it's funny. We, we talked a little bit before we started. And I'm, I'm from Eden, Utah. Um, background in Mormonism. And as Terry Joe always said, where our Jesus is better than yours. <laughs> 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 uh, but, you know, I've been writing songs in town. It'll be on December 15th will be my uh, 19th anniversary here. And uh, it's been an incredible journey. And uh, just from literally starting out at the Broken Spoke where I, I ran into Jeff, that was 19 years ago. And it was shortly thereafter that I met Randall and... Uh, came out to the Rusty Nail was the first time I'd been introduced to you. Kevin came to the Rusty yes, Nail. Yes, Kevin had been out to the Rusty Nail. He survived that. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I loved it. And then Dan McGinnis. I mean, it's been in a different, you know, in a location near you. But I agree that the local should be the final resting place. <laughs> in these, the last <laughs> moments of our lives. He's always trying to kill us. <laughs> no. Uh, but anyway, yeah, um, there, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, it's funny. You had mentioned earlier about how there's just something special with this group, you know, and uh, it's it's so much more than the Nashville machine. It's a place where you find a home. You know, Cameron mentioned that was his first co-write, and in that first co-write, we found out he had a failing heart. That's how I got the name Blue. I had a failing heart. We both had open heart surgery, um, you know, so it's it's just crazy how interwoven you end up and how friends become family i mean there's been times where i've been completely destitute and gone to jeff and said man i need work and i, I had a job the next day and you know that's that's family you know? that's family so, yeah jeff yeah. i've been here 28 years i moved from simpsonville south carolina small little town outside of greenville um uh, you know, fell into the, there were a lot of little writers venues around town back then, a lot more than there are now. And uh, just over the years, I watched them disappear and they just disappeared. And he mentioned the Broken Spoke. That was a magical place for a few years in time, actually really small window, maybe four or five years. <clears throat> and I met more people there that went on to have success than anywhere in this town. And, um, uh, I, I had some issues and moved away for a little while. I had a, a bandsaw accident <laughs> working at Gibson Guitars, and so I moved away for a while, and then I came back. And when I came back, it was with the notion that, you know, I want to create a place that, that had that feel again because I just didn't see that in Nashville. I mean, yeah, there were a few places to go play, but it didn't feel like the family, like everybody knew each other. And everybody wanted everybody to do good. You know what I mean? Right. It was kind of more like a, you know, to me it was a little more. Show up, you know, do my thing. Do leave. my thing and go. But I wanted a place where people wanted to hang and meet and be kind of the connecting spot, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> and so that's what I started trying to create. It took me a while to be able to come up with the funds to do it and do everything I needed to do. When I found out that the, the home where they were doing the freak show was we the, started at the blue bar, blue bar. with yeah. chuck rota yeah, yeah. And great we guy. were there awesome. 2014 awesome through 16 or 16, 17 17. um and then they closed it yeah and yeah. jeff tried to get us and to come I, over i reached out i did and i and i said i think this is the place and, and she said well we want to stay right where we're at and she had another offer across the street across so the street. i thought that made sense <laughs> it was across the to street. just location, move across location, the street location. but i think the difference there was it, you either have people that understand music and get get it or you have a venue a, a bar venue owner that's just in it to sell liquor and and but i, I didn't open it for that i mean I'm, i have to have to do it in order to you know, um, pay the bills, but but I wanted a place for the music community, so I think that's where the difference is. And what the Music Row Freak Show is for, I don't want to assume that people know what we're talking about. Um, Nashville is the biggest community of songwriters probably in the world, and so it's a songwriter showcase night where about 15 or 16 writers a show 
get up and perform three songs that they wrote. And there's a long list of regulars that have been playing it since the beginning or have, we've picked up along the way. And then there is an even longer list of new kids that have come to town, old and young, like Cam Cam over here. He loves it when I call him. <laughs> She's the um, only Nashville person I like calling Cam Cam. <laughs> um, I earned it. Um, so that's what the Music Row Freak Show is. It is a showcase for songwriters to perform songs that they have on the radio or the song they wrote that day. Awesome. So let's go back to 2014. You started it. What prompted you starting the Music Row Freak Show? Well, to be perfectly honest, I got a DUI <laughs> and I needed to pay for it. Hell yeah. <laughs> yes. God, I love you so much. I love DJ. that. I knew that story. I Kevin knew, knew that. that. He baited me. He teed <laughs> me up for that. Uh, I had it done. Be any more perfect. <laughs> I had done a the same format with Bobby Pinson, who is a award-winning number one songwriter in town that is one of our best friends. And he was the face and it was his show and I did all the booking for it. Meanwhile, booking and hosting and owning two other writer's nights. So I was doing it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every week. It was a lot. But um, when Bobby decided to quit his uh, Sing for Your Supper is what he called it because um, all the performers got free dinner which is a big deal for broke songwriters yes it is <laughs> and um when he closed the restaurant um we quit the show and the venue had offered for me to continue um doing the show without bobby under a different brand and i was like Ugh, i already i have two going right now so a third one is a lot so i'm gonna pass on that and then i had this little um encounter with the law and <laughs> I needed to pay for it. And so I went to Chuck, the owner of the venue, and said, yeah, I think I will start a new show. And um, I've always um, called all these guys freaks because they are. They're, freak, they're freaks in nature because they're, they're so talented. And so I decided to call it the Midtown Freak Show. And then the brilliant mind of Mr. Kevin Jonas said, why don't you call it Music Row Freak Show because it rhymes. And uh, uh, the country doesn't know what Midtown is, but they do know what Music Row is. Right. So he, uh, back to, Solid which advice. circles us back to the fact that Kevin has had a vision for this for a long time because he knew he was going to take us to the world. We just didn't know that. <laughs> I'm ready to do that. So it started with a DUI. Now, how did you meet Blue? Because Blue was... Rusty Nell. Yeah. When I came in, you were already there. And yes. you, you sang a song... And I turned around to people around me, and it was like, well, that was a perfect country song. Oh, you just made damn me tear up. Love, so, damn my heart. And then got to play that at your son's wedding. Yes. I mean, you know, that that song has taken me on such a journey, and thank you. I'll, I'll never forget it. It was, you were running McGinnis. It was at Dan McGinnis the night that I met him. He came in, and I played that, and he came up to me afterwards and complimented, and we have been solid friends ever since and that song's had a great journey and ironically enough meeting her i actually met at the rusty nail and i never i don't remember you at the rusty nail but there was a lot of nights at the rusty nail me and randall were full randall <laughs> which is another og freak <laughs> that is now in heaven um but i do recall when i knew that moment i knew i had to be there and it wasn't the freak show yet but randall came home it was a tuesday night you were running the rusty nail he came home with eyes the size of silver dollars and was like oh my god i have found the new broken spoke and it wasn't that it was the rusty nail it was the the demographic it was the the vibe the friendship the songs the way you ran the show people got up one at a time even though songwriter rounds, there's banter in those songwriter rounds, you do a showcase songwriter night where it's one writer that gets up and does their thing and they own it or they crash and burn. And that's what makes it real. You know, it's the eagle circle of death, if you will. You get up there and you either do your thing or, you know, you, you get judged. 
uh, I, I, not true, not true. No, but you anyway, do. You, you, do. You, you do. I mean, you do. <laughs> and what it is, I mean, like with Cam, uh, to be, to speak to that, when he came and I said, look, just go and hang out. And when you get up, let people approach you. Mm-hmm. You don't need to ask anybody for anything. Everybody in that crowd is incredible. And once they start to see your talent, they will approach you, which is exactly what happened. I remember him That's coming home. Yeah, through Scott Sean White. And and then I remember the day you were living. Yeah, exactly. TJ's obviously a big fan, as am I. You came and knocked on my door and said, Barrett Paper just asked me to write. And I was like, That's the freak show. That's yeah. how it is. And it is a rite of passage, but you earn that rite of passage. But Speaking to the OG so let story. me let me jump in here sure. because a lot of people I've come to realize don't actually know what a writer's round is, and it is as common as water. Right. You know, people, songwriters gather here in a way that it doesn't happen around the world, and it, you know it's different than New York. It's obviously different than it, it's a different approach than L.A. You guys together, like what a what does a writer's round mean to you? How, how, how how do you view a, a writer's round if you were talking to somebody, let's say in India or China, which you are, right. what is a writer's round? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to the city? Uh, I would guess that the actual term writer's round came from um, like Douglas Corner and those That's venues Bluebird. that you literally sat in a circle like the Bluebird Cafe. You sat in a circle and went around the circle. Song, Kevin plays a song, I play a song, Cameron plays a song, Jeff plays a song, Blue, and we go around the circle. It's mm-hmm. a writer's round. And now they call any any uh, multi-writer show, acoustic show, it's, it's always, almost always, just you and your guitar, your guitar player, maybe a djembe or something, but it's not a full band thing. Sometimes a piano. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's piano. yeah, a piano. Um and you play songs that you wrote and so the freak show started with it did start with you doing your thing up there by yourself. We have moved into rounds um for time's sake um because it just takes a long time to sound check um between every three songs. Mm-hmm. So we now do two or three or if somebody says look i don't want to play with anybody i don't play by myself i'm like you do your thing play by yourself so there's you know it's it's easy it's flex but that is where in texas they call it a song swap because you're swapping back and forth um nashville it's if you see itr in the round that is in the round in the round Mm -hmm. and what does it feel like you're the you're the young guy what does it feel like to get up and and i'm gonna lay lay some foundation here i came to nashville knocked on every door on music row uh and i thought i had something i thought i had some talent i thought i had some songs it would have overwhelmed me as a singer and i am as a writer i am to get up in front of the people that are here you know, it didn't take me long here to realize that the cab driver driver that brought me from the airport was better than me. <laughs> the lady who was behind the desk at the hotel was better than me. Emptying ashtrays and setting up beers in a dive down on Music Road. It is unbelievable the level of talent. So as a young guy, and I'm not trying to intimidate you here, no. but as a young guy, I went through it. I saw talent everywhere. And my first recording session here... They brought, like, the Nashville Cats into play. And everybody that touched a guitar was better than me. And then the piano, and then the vocalist. And I, it actually was part of my journey to go to the business side because I was like, they're all better than me, and some of them are struggling to survive. What does it feel like to you to stand up in front of a room full of people where you've got, in the freak show, now people that have broken out of it like the ashley mcbrides who are up for best female vocal vocalist song but you're there in front of them and barrett baber who was finalist on the voice and this talented group of people but it starts with people like you coming into town like garth brooks did back in the day 
You might be a Garth Brooks. You might not be a Garth Brooks. You might be a songwriter, but what does it feel like to have that opportunity to get up there, whether that's positive, negative, or a mix of the two, what does it feel like for you? Well, one, there's nothing like playing anytime you get to play, but two, you better have the courage to get your teeth kicked in and just welcome it and just take every little win as a win. Um, because, like, I remember the, the first time I played Freak Show, Scott Sean White is the one that got me on a bill as a favor. And uh, TJ didn't know me. Nobody knew me. Um, I remember Blue because he's loud. Uh, <laughs> he's tall and he's loud. But, uh, and handsome. <laughs> yeah, that. I was going to say that. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I, I had some songs that I thought were something and I played. And when I say not a, like, not a sympathy club, like people were just eating. And just, you know, like, um, and I just looked at Scott afterwards and he was like, it happens, man. And then oh, I happens. just went home and just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And then, I mean, every week you get your teeth kicked in because you have people that have written with Ashley McBride. You have Ashley McBride. You have Barrett. You have Laney. Or you've got Russell. platinum. Yeah, people with number ones. Um, oh, I, I know. Uh, it, I moved out to Arizona to pursue my songwriting. <laughs> Actually, my in-laws had a business. They wanted us to come out and help. I was in a transition, so I went out, and they had the Arizona Songwriters Association. So I went to go check it out, and you paid a little fee, and you went in, and it was a little bit like a round, but you'd play your demos. And they would have guests in, and they would come, and they would speak. And so because they were fairly close to L.A., you'd have all these top producers and publishers and writers and at the end, they would listen to your demo and give critiques. And so they're listening to all these demos that were more refined than mine. Mine were, you know, simple song demos. And these people were all getting produced by producers, and they had more money than I did. And I was intimidated, but I finally said, okay, I'm going to present a song. Well, the speaker that week was a Motown guy. And I played this song that was kind of a love song like a love song to god but it could be a love song for a girl and about halfway through it first verse and chorus he said stop 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 i can't take it anymore <laughs> this is in front of 30 or 40 people <laughs> oh, no. i can't take it anymore this is so cliche how many of you agree with me and every hand went up and i was devastated and i went home and I'm crying. Aww. I go to my wife, Denise, and I'm like, honey, <laughs> I need to oh, kiss. Oh, my music's cliche. This was a mistake. <laughs> but you wrote a song that night, I would assume. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I cried. Um, <laughs> that's all I did was cry. <laughs> and I was crying because he called my lyrics cliche, but I thought they were clever because there was a twist. It's to God and, you know, it can fit in that gray zone. And, you know, yeah, it was a little bit like, I love you so much as a lyric, but there was a combination. So anyway, I'm there crying, and she said, well, who is this guy? And I said, it's the guy that wrote ABC, easy as one, two, three. <gasps> and she goes, and you are being criticized about cliche? <laughs> but ABC, one, two, three? And she actually schooled me. She's like, a great song is a great song. ABC isn't cliche if it's great. Your words aren't bad if they're great. And she picked me up, but I needed it because I never after that day, of course I love ABC one, two, three. I never after that day lacked the cliche filter. Does that right. make sense? Absolutely. After that, I'm going, is it cliche or not as a starting point? So it helped me, it hurt me. I did feel like I dived and crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. But my wife picked me up and after that, I left with a tool I didn't have before, mm -hmm. that I needed someone with greater success who wrote a song that used simpler themes but was eternal, mm -hmm. yeah. and I didn't have that. And so after that day, every lyric I write, and my first breakthrough was as a lyricist on a platinum song, it, it was, has this been said before about this theme can we second guess it? And it changed me. So 
it's so valuable to have an encouraging community, but will give you constructive criticism. Yeah, well, in the you do get your teeth kicked in, but in a positive way. Yeah, you know, like I've learned so, so much in a year just from being here, and and people like Blue and TJ and Jeff taking the time to be like, well, this isn't great, but but this part's good, and you know, this has like, potential. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, Scott uh, Sean White, the, he was the first person I played songs for before I went to Freak Show. He said, well. The good news is you don't suck. <laughs> <laughs> the Nashville non-compliment compliment. Yeah, yeah. It's like the good news is you can you can do this if you just are willing to take the hits and and the hits come, but also like y'all have picked me up so much and shown me so much love and support. You know, um, the biggest thing I used good. to tell you when you were living with me was get out of your head and get out of your own way. Yeah, for sure. You know, and 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 I, and to see you spread your wings and do that is beautiful because it's night and day now, from a year ago, to where you are now. To watch you play a music row freak show, you've a you found your tribe, all pun intended. Um, B, you're starting to find your writer's voice and your artist voice, and it's beautiful to watch that week in and week out when I get to see you play the yeah. Freak Show. Watch you, you know. But you're saying that now as a seasoned songwriter who's been doing this for a long time. What was your first outing in a songwriter's round? Oh, well, I got I got, I got to share with you a story. So Tom Collins, whom Jeff knows, and you've heard this, this is, you want to talk about devastation, just getting your teeth kicked in. I was go ahead. Down there. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to remind Blue we only have an hour. <laughs> right, right. I'm going to make this quick. <laughs> no, I want you to tell At it. At one point, Tom Collins had 17 of the top 20 country hits as a publisher. Sylvia, Barbara Mandrell, Ronnie Millsap. I mean, this guy, Tom T. Hall wrote for Tom Collins. Yeah. Okay. And the Dirt Drifters, the guys I had my first single with, signed a publishing deal. I write my first solo song. I am so excited. And I was trying to get a deal then, okay? And man, it's this, it's in drop D, it's this Keith Urban thing, you know, and it's called Coal Town. And the whole setup is when where you're from ain't where you want to be. Hmm. They're pouring a coal town. And man, I'm just, I'm in it to win it. And Ray was getting a record deal at the time. Um, Ray. Uh, Scott. Yeah, Ray Scott. Scott. And so all these guys, Tom took them to lunch. And... <laughs> I get to play this song for Tom Collins and about nine of my closest friends, all of them either producers, signed writers, record deals. And I get done and Tom leans over his desk. He, he had kicked his feet up on the desk, just total CEO style. He, you know this, I Jeff. Know I, I, I mean, I'm it. surprised Jeff wasn't there because Moke was I and Moke and I and Jeff I were friends. I'm, well, I might not have been, but I was writing down there a lot. Yeah, yeah, he was at that same time. <laughs> and he leans over and he goes, well, that sounds like Marty Robbins. And I just perk up. I'm like, oh, what a compliment. And then I'm like, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't sound like Marty Robbins. And I, I start to get that look, and he just leans over and goes, El Paso. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> yeah, dude. And it was in front of every peer that I had. And I, that, I went home, and I boohooed. And I talked to my boys, and they were like, Blue, it's a good song. Tom's that way. And my, my peers picked me up. But yeah, you know, and so at the same time, it's one of those things that it, but that's what gives you the grit to make it. You know what I mean? That's what gives you the grit to dig your heels in and come back stronger and write that song that is going to turn that head, that is going to make somebody feel something. You well, know? this is a business where, you know, I've said often about labels. They are literally trained to say no. Oh, they're looking for something not to like. It, uh, every time. At, at every spot. Everybody is, not just the, labels. In the journey, it's, well, not your publisher. He he likes everything. <laughs> <laughs> to oh, shame. Okay. Yep. Um, you're a genius, and I love you, <laughs> and your songs are amazing. <laughs> but they're trained to say no. They're trained to look for no, and even if things are great, they're looking at the other things that aren't complimenting it. So there's always that journey. But this is a, a business where even if you're in a supportive environment, you take rejection constantly. Your babies, you know, uh, I, I think the world out there 
may not understand that you give birth to a song that you love it feels like Mm -hmm. it's your child it's It's a piece of you it's a piece of you it's a part of your life if you care about the song a lot of the songs you've lived and so that rejection is sometimes painful uh how would you speak to that um well i I moved here in 93 and the first the first painful rejection i had was with a a songwriter his son worked with me when i found out who his dad was i I knew who he was but when i found out that was his dad i said you gotta play him some of my songs so he showed up one night to work and he actually took a cassette tape you know Mm -hmm. i'm old so it was a cassette tape so he took a cassette tape and said, I'll, I'll take it home, listen to it, and I'll give you some feedback. And when he came back, mind you, this guy was Songwriter of the Year three times in the 90s. Um, when he did come back, <laughs> we're, we're going song by song, and uh, he, he wasn't exactly nice. He was just pointing out everything, you know. I, can, th- I same- think I know who it is <clears throat> if it was... Well, that many times in the night, but I won't same, say. Same type of thing. No, no, I'm not going to say. But same type of thing. It was uh, cliche. Time to know. Time to know. This is that. Yeah. And it was. It was the same type of thing. And and so, he said, you know, <clears throat> I did whatever I could so I could play the writers' nights like Douglas Corner. Actually, Douglas Corner was the first place I'd ever went when I came to town because of another hit writer. But he said. Uh, he said, well, when I moved here, this is how I did, da, da, da. And I said, oh, so a lot like me. And he, and he actually said, no, not that bad. <laughs> and, and when he said that, I literally went home. Because I, I moved here with maybe 10 or 15 songs that I'd written. Yeah. And, and they were. I mean, they weren't horrible, but they were, you know, tracked to like, you know. My uh, songs were horrible. I sold yeah. furniture to come yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. show people horrible songs yeah. that were not yeah. developed, yeah. that were mm-hmm. part of my journey. But we don't know that where we're from. I, you know when we come. Yeah, I had a youth pastor. Right. For those of you that are not from like the church world, it's the guy that works with the teenagers in the church. And I, my first three chords, I, I wrote a song over them, and he came in and he's like, "You're like Elvis. You're like." <laughs> yeah. I, he starts throwing out the geniuses in the pop world at the time. Yeah. And, and you believe a part him. of me believed, okay, then I can show this to songwriter of the year. Right. And he'll think the same thing. Right. That did not happen. <laughs> well, the same when, th- I mean, I was in a band. I was in a in a band doing a, I was hired to do the brand new stuff cuz they were doing old stuff and they hired me. So we want you to do this new stuff, Travis Tritt and uh Helen Jackson. You are truly dating. <laughs> so I'm, I'm dating yeah, my... The I, new kids. I, I, the new the, kids. The new stuff. They, yeah. they hired yeah. me to do the new stuff. And we would have a hundred... place sat about 600 people and have 100 people waiting to get in. And we were killing. And the, the owner said, you need to go to Nashville. Well, you know, I'd been writing a little bit and I thought I had something, you know. Mm-hmm. And I came to Nashville and I had zero. I mean, it literally, <clears throat> for two years, I don't think I even went out I mean, I was so devastated at that point that I just thought my stuff was so crappy. Then <clears throat> I went out to a, a writer's thing one night and played, and then uh, there was a good little group there, and I started going back, Broken Spoke. And, and then I played another place one time, and a guy came up and caught, and he said, Jeff Reed, and, and he, he happened to be a hit writer. Larry Johnson wrote Don't Take the Girl for Tim McGraw. Mm-hmm. And I said, he knew my name. He goes, man, I like this stuff that you were playing. And so that little, that one little thing, that Larry's no longer with us and neither is Craig, they wrote that. But that one little thing, that guy coming up and saying, Jeff Reed, and he knew my name and he said, I like your stuff, mm-hmm. gave me a whole new confidence boost to start playing. And the, the spoke, the thing for us back then for me was – we all played it on the started on Sundays because Sunday was the open. You could go in and sign up and play, and then we got booked into Lee's nights and Debbie's nights. But the main thing for me was all week long I was trying to write something to impress everybody. Everybody does. When that I got change. back on the next Sunday, I wanted to get up and play this new song I wrote and see people's reaction. Mm-hmm. And I think the freak show 
absolutely 100%. does the exact same type yeah. of thing where people and that, I don't know that everybody was doing that then, but that was in my head like every week. It's like, man, I gotta write a song. It's well, at the away. Arizona Songwriters Association, it was monthly. It took a month of my wife going, no, 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 you got it, yeah. you've got it, you're gonna get there. So I went back, and of course I was afraid to even show my face. Yeah, nobody cared. Yeah, nobody. It was even mostly just pride sure. in me, sure. you know. <clears throat> and they had the guy that had produced the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. So oh. this was like <laughs> massive, and I only had one song I wrote about a girl that was a friend of mine who passed away one tiny rose which was also a big cliche put it in there he teared up he got emotional talking about it he had just lost a friend hmm. he asked to speak to me afterwards oh. he said if you're ever in LA come and see me so following it came an encouragement that I live with to this day Amen. Uh, it's almost like you know we need that moment of conflict and we need to fight through it and and some people give up then they they like they're in town they leave town it's done but it was the next month that i got a validation i received a validation that actually helped me in my career okay i'm not the worst i don't suck in fact this guy with huge success loved my stuff Amen. simple as it may have been Absolutely. he loved it and that really did take me forward yeah. um and of course, yes, that is a part of the freak show. Let's let's jump ahead. You've been writing for a while, and Cam Cam. <laughs> I don't know that you've had this feeling yet, but I'm going to set it up. So, I came to town actually for an event, and I heard through a drummer friend of mine that Michael W. Smith was looking for lyrics for a song. He, of course, did all his music. And in the Christian world, you know, he's one of the most decorated of all time. And it was this rocking song that was way outside my comfort zone. But I said, give me the night. And I went home and I started working on this song. That turned out to be my first gold record. That wow. song, one night, wow. just like really focused. And I'll never forget when I heard that song and knew it was going to be on the record and a friend of mine, Nicole C. Mullen, I don't know if you know mm -hmm. that name, but what Nicole, a singer. Mm -hmm. what a singer. Mm -hmm. And at the release party, well, actually no, the gold record party, I came in town. She said, you finally got your hit. Mm -hmm. And back when she was developing as a writer, I'd like open the music department door for her so she could come in and rehearse and sing. Wow. And here she was at, the top and moving up, uh, validating that. Take me to like your first cut and you'll get there. But your first cut where you're now hearing your song and, and it goes through such a process that for those of you that are out there, you don't understand, you're pitching, you're pitching, you're pitching, somebody finds it, it might be on hold. You know, they'll be holding it, they'll put it aside, they might pay you a little bit, they probably don't. You never know really if it's gonna go or not and they're writing songs with other people and you hope it'll get there and it'll make it through the filter and when it finally does and you now have a song. What was that like for you? Whew. Um, the, the first memory that comes to mind is I had some independent cuts on some Christian artist and some country artist, but I wrote a song with Trent Tomlinson called Come Back to Bed that in Ash Underwood that Trent put out as a single on XM radio. And I was in Key West and we had run to the grocery store to get food for the Airbnb. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not what it was at the time. I don't think Airbnb was a thing then, but, um, and we were in the grocery store and come back to bed, came over the speakers. <laughs> come on. Yes. And I was with my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So that was even, even better. better. Amen. And Trick Savage yeah. and uh, Gary Chapman was with us. And there's a king of the Christian world. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so many songs. Yeah. So. And what did you feel? You, you know, moments like that. You, you dream about them and you dream about them. And then when you're in the moment, it's so surreal. It's, it's like 
you need a minute to process, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. For and, sure. and I, and, and, you know, thank God that he's blessed me with those moments, you know, and that never get old. <laughs> Boy, that's well, true. just throw it out there and not for pride's sake, but share some of the people you've had cuts with. Um, Wade Hayes, Trisha Yearwood, Ashley McBride, Miranda Lambert, Eric Church, Trent Tomlinson, Michelle Wright, Cody Johnson, Barrett Baber, Gwen Sebastian. Um, God, I just got okay. Butterflies. Now you're just you're I don't know. <laughs> I love now it. you're just causing envy. Uh, no, I just <laughs> no, it's beautiful. I love that. I, it's I never beautiful. knew you had a cut with Wade Hayes. That's so cool. I just, how did I just find that out? I've known you 20 years. I wrote it with Wade. Did you? And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. I was rocking the 90s then, man. I was like, <laughs> it wasn't the 90s anymore, <laughs> but I was getting those cuts on those 90s. Even Shenandoah cut one of my songs. Yep. Oh, that's great. And uh, they oh, never put God. it out, but I did. Get, I wish I could find it. It's probably on a cassette somewhere or CD. It's on oh. a CD somewhere, but Marty Rabin actually sang oh. it. Because, you know, he left the band, came back, left the band, came mm-hmm. back, and they went in and cut it with Marty and so I have Marty on singing wow. the uh, the lead on it. So good. Um, it never saw the light of day, but it saw. I I heard it, and that was a, you know I'm like I can move back to Texas now. <laughs> That's awesome. What about you? Uh, you know it. <laughs> it's funny. Damn love the song. Damn love. So I'd written the damn love with the Dirt Drifters. They ended up signing at Warner Brothers Records, and uh, I I got pulled into Chris Lacey's office, and she's been at Warner for a long while, and is just one of the most incredible women that you'll ever, ever Love meet. Her. She signed the Dirt Drifters, she signed Ashley McBride, she's just picked some great artists that have just, Cole Swindell, um, and this is circa 2007, and I sit down in her office, and it's the first time I've ever been in that corporate environment. You know, I'm at, I'm literally in the corner office at Warner Brothers. And she plays Damn Love, ironically enough. And she's like, Blue, this is a really, really good song. And I played it for Rivers Rutherford, and he thinks so as well. So, you know, that nugget of the complete opposite of Tom, even though Tom was joking, it was that, that nugget of hope. Then she drops the bomb. I want you to get ready. And I said, get ready for what? She said, well, the Dirt Drifters have decided on their third single. And in three months, there she goes, goes to... Billboard 100 radio, you know, uh, what is it called? Not terrestrial, but the big one. Anyway, the charts and media base. Yes, media base. The 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 big the big uh, ooh, for and, radio. Yeah, you know, for radio. And I was I broke down in tears at that moment. And now and then and then you fast forward that next three months, and just the idea of knowing that I was having a single come out, I landed an incredible publishing deal went into a professional environment as a songwriter that I've never had to look back from. And then fast forward three more months, I'm in Utah on a trip home with my mom and I turn on my home station Mm. and cable 93 plays, there she goes. And I was with my mom the first time I heard my song on the radio. That's awesome. And you are right, it never gets old. Because when Ashley did it with Tired of Being Happy, it was the same feeling. So, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. That's great. What about you? Well, I mean, I haven't had the success these guys have. Uh, the, the first, the first uh, cut, I think, that we had, uh, me and a, a, my best friend, probably for 25 years, Craig Monday, wrote. And I was riding up West End, and it was a Tower Records. <clears throat> Before the big billboard at the split over there, Tower used to have yep. a big wall, and they would put up, like, the next thing. And we had written this song called Something Worth Fighting For. And I'm driving up West End, and there's this cowboy on this thing, and it says, Something Worth Fighting For, Out Now, or whatever. And I called Craig, and I said, Son of a gun, man. Somebody stole our title. They've written that. You know, <laughs> God, I'm so pissed about this, you know, honestly. And I, I was mad. And then the next day, you know, this was at, in an evening, and the next day somebody called and they said, "Congratulations on the song cut." And I didn't even know we had we'd got a cut. Wow! I didn't know so this. I had played it at a at a uh, at a thing on Music Row, 
And this one producer said, do you, you have a copy of that? And I said, well, I've got a vocal guitar, and I gave it to him. And the next thing I know, it ends up on the side of Tower Records. So it, it was, a, you know, it was one of those things. And wow. it, it didn't go on to be a huge success. I don't, I don't know if his team There are was, so many you know, factors in that yeah, that yeah. some of the best songs, Desperado, oh, yeah. barely cracked the top 40. Right. Like, the, there are great songs. Speaking of Desperado, this little sneaky over here, we were at his son's wedding reception, and he gets up oh, and I sings Desperado, and we had never, I'd known him for, at the time, five, six years, never heard him sing. Amazing. And we were all like, what? Yeah. Kevin, you <laughs> sandbagger. He is a sandbagger. I completely agreed. I like, you know what, I've, I've hit my call. I sing, I write, I love it. My greatest passion is helping other people. I feel the same way. Uh, that That's my passion. Ooh. I l- Let me help you get there. Uh, that, that, that lights me up. If I contribute, great, but I actually have more fun. There's a, and when I look back at my life, that's what I did everywhere. Uh, so it fits my character, but yes, I do sing. I'm, you know, I'm an okay, I'm a good singer, right? That's not proud. That's not pride. It's not a proud statement. I'm a good singer. What I'll tell my artist, and it's my go-to line, I'll go in the studio and I'll say, well, this is, this is good, but I can do this. We're not done here until you do something in this song we mere mortals can't do. <laughs> I'm telling you, I get great stuff. <laughs> then they do. And I'll tell you with Lainey, look out world. That girl, yeah, when incredible. she sings, I was just listening to a song and her ad lib, because she's such, she's got such, we used to call it like chest, but it's, it's just the fullness of a voice, right? She's, she's got that. But unlike the Ariana's that have their ad libs that go up, hers go down. And, and she, of course, like most people going through school, you see solos go to the people that can do the bombastic songs. But how long has it been since we've had a Karen Carpenter? Right. So I just listened to a song of her, and it was just... And she just lands on this deep note, and it's like chills. <laughs> but anyway, that sets me off now. Yeah. Like, I want to help people. That's part of what this is is I have a dream of an arena. And by the way, some of my dreams have come true. I have a n- dream of an arena, and in this arena, it will be filled with passionate fans of this island of misfit <laughs> toys Slow clap. That, that aren't your stereotypical artist, and they are loving you and loving the songs and they lived it with you and they watched it with you and we delivered the song at the end of an episode that changes their life right and and because they can live it with you i don't know that there's another show where you end the show and you have like something you can go to you know you and barrett wrote along with scott scott you wrote a song that was literally about him saying about his daughter, and God bless the boy who has to deal with this. <laughs> and it became Truth. what I consider like a career song. Yes. Like it's why I, I like I want to work with you. I want to be part of that song. And it's not commerce. I mean, I hope it produces. I hope it does. But it's a belief in that. I want the world to be able to see that. I want them to be able to watch that journey, be there for that comment, watch the writing of the song, and the end result be not necessarily the long journey to get it in front of an artist who then hopefully releases it, but people like us that don't fit specifically that model, and you sing it, and you deliver it, Amen. and they watch you do it. And then everything else, and that is one thing about the character of the freak show that I love so much, is that you can be alternative. You can be outside of the norms of the genre, and it's perfect inside that setting. Yes. That's what makes me love the freak show we so much. We have 
we have Ava Page, who is 17 years old and battling leukemia and was playing before that with hair down past her rear. And now she's growing her hair back. back. And then we have the Helene Cronins, who are older than me. I don't, you know, who is make on her sophomore record, you know, uh, and travels back and forth. And we've got people who used to be circus clowns. We've got, (laughs) we've got the LV Shanes who got his publishing deal and his record deal from playing the freak show. His, the video went viral for my boy Uh and got, they, um, they played my boy, got the day they got their publishing deal. And then he played it at the freak show and the video went viral and he broke and both signed him, just had a number one record. Um, you know, and then we've got our... I've got chills. Yeah, yeah. we've got our Ashley McBrides, which is an obvious success story. We've got our Dan Smalley's and Josiah Siska and Drew our Casey Green. Tindall's and Lainey Wilson and Lainey Gardner. And, you know, and then we've got our Cam Cams, who the up and had, a, had a meeting yesterday with a record label. For the same reason. And because he heard them at the Freak Show. Come on. Um, mm-hmm. And so... It is. It's. It's. It's not about being the perfect package. It's about the music and the family. You know the perfect package lie. I've worked with a lot of artists, from girl groups to my own sons to some of the best female vocalists out there. Like, it's all a lie. The, the most beautiful people sometimes are the most insecure anyway for sure and the standards are not realistic right Th- those those rules you walk in and they look at you I, you know i don't know if anybody here's old enough to have watched like the partridge family but there's one like when the older brother gets a record deal and then they change up all his music uh, if you've ever seen that episode if you haven't go find it somewhere And he's like, why did you do this? Why would you do this to my music? And they were like, well, you fit the suit. And it was the outfit that he would wear. Mm -hmm. I can tell you there's a lot of that in this business. And what I love about this is the heart of the song to the audience. And if we can get that right, and I hope we can, from the heart of the artist and the heart of the writer to the world, that's just that that's that's not alarms outside fire trucks and ambulances. Well, you're saying something that's that the that's the trumpets going off that's at a great a- idea <laughs> uh i that was time. i, I gen- genuinely believe that that's possible today and i think there's an audience out there that needs some of those false standards to be broken down yeah and and i'm not saying you don't look like artists. The truth is, what I'm really saying is that term of artist needs to be broken down. And 70-year-olds need record deals. Amen. And, and, you know, look at what's happening in the world in country music. I mean, you don't have to be small to be one of the biggest stars in the world. Amen. And you can break off of TikTok and be a massive star today. Uh, and I love that. Well, look, I... We have to bring this to a close. We're going to do this again, uh, and we're going to keep it going. Uh, I hope that by the time we air this, we will be filming full time on the freak show. Mm. Uh, that, Lord, that are you listening? <laughs> uh, I really do believe we have something really compelling, and I think the world needs to see this side of it. You know. Uh, as a young guy, I used to literally, this is the truth, I would sit in front of the TV for award shows because we didn't have the internet back then. And I would sit in front of the TV with a notepad, and I'm seven, eight, nine years old, writing down the names as they're thanking people. Then going to our library where they actually had the albums and looking at the inserts oh, and cross referencing the liner notes with my notes. This is who they think. This is where they work. This is. I couldn't afford a Billboard magazine growing up in a cotton mill village mm. in North Carolina, but I loved it so much. And I've met so many people, and I'm like, oh, you worked with so and so back in the '70s, and they're like, how, how would you know, you know that? that? 
I don't know. I did my homework. I did my homework, but it was a passion. Yeah. And it was the people behind it. And that's part of why I love songwriters is, you know, you guys lived it. Some of the singers haven't lived it. Some of the singers can't even relate to it. But you lived it the hard way or the happy way. It, you were inspired on a boat. You were inspired on a mountaintop. You were inspired by the birth or the death. And that created the song. And I think if people see that, there's a chance that this could actually be, because the talent level, there's no question, this could be something that has its moment. That, that's, that's my heart. So I want to thank you for being here. Thank you. I truly love you guys. I'm so glad you're doing better. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so glad I walked in. I mean, I say 10 years ago, I, it's hard for me to even imagine. Seven, eight, nine it was years ago. about I don't even, 2011. 2011. So oh, we're talking right at 10 years. Yeah. I've gone through a cancer battle, uh, like a uh, pandemic, other things. Uh, so glad I walked in that day. So glad I met you. So glad I, I, I love your writing. So glad I met you and went, how is he not, like, noticed? How is he not a massive star? How is he not the top writer in Nashville? And recently met you, and you'll be part of this ongoing. Guys, you're in my heart. We're going to do this. Even if it's just this, I hope there's a budding songwriter or an artist out there. I hope that you get a little encouragement from what you've heard today and get past that first criticism. Yes, you need to play it for somebody other than your mom who thinks you wrote everything and it's wonderful, but get through that criticism, get through that improvement, go through the disappointments of thinking you're there and having to wait. This is a, this is a testimony of what it can be. So all my love, guys. Mm. Love Thanks you so, so much. Thank you. And we will see you on the other side. Thank you. Thank you.